Hey, Erica, how are you doing? Pretty good. Afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Rail. And uh, I'm Ken Esten, and always, you know, we have our esteemed uh, host over here, Erto Jackson. So how's everything yeah. going on your side, Erto? Uh, pretty pretty good over here. Uh, I'm just having a problem with my chickens. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you should probably get that looked at. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh you know chickens are not everything's chickens are just kind of a docile little bird you know and, and if you feel sorry to eat them it, you know i know somebody who had a big a big chicken farm i mean like thousands of chickens and they were all free range but they were in a, like a big warehouse but they could run all over they wanted wherever they could go yeah and you go into that place and it was so disgustingly stinking yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it smelled so bad, you'd never want to eat one of those birds. And the fact that, and then they would peck each other, and they have to pull out the dead birds and the partial birds and the, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he started this kind of late in life, and he thought it'd be easy. And he said it was so hard, and he hated the birds. Mm -hmm. And this is funny because you, you and I have talked about your birds, and yeah, I never thought to mention this before that he, um, he stopped eating chicken. He couldn't eat chicken anymore. Yeah, he just found him so disgusting that he couldn't eat him anymore. He could eat he could eat um, um, ham and bacon because everything's pigs are disgusting, but they're not that disgusting. Yeah, they're kind of clean compared to these birds. Yeah, and, and and you're telling me the story about your bird that attacks you. That you have a rooster that attacks you. Goes oh, yeah. to his juggler. Yeah, you know, it's like wow. He's an asshole. Yeah, you know, I used to be a vegetarian, but then like when these birds started acting up, now I eat chicken right in front of them, you know, and just to kind of oh, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, a little bit of a let, warning. I set the barbecue up right next to their chicken run, you know, just yeah, so let them know who's, who's the boss. Then, yeah, you know, yeah. You know? Well, you know, if they step out of line, you know, it's it's the grill for them, you know. But I think I think it's great that you raise chickens. I mean, it's, I mean, you you're not in a in a rural area and you're raising all these chickens. This is pretty interesting. But yeah, but you know what's crazy is, um, you know, I gave because I have a lot, you know, so I had to give some away. And I gave my next door neighbor has a bunch of chickens, and he lets them free range. Like you'll see them wandering around in the street and everything. Like oh really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's like crazy. Like they're on other people's lawns and everything, just walking yeah. around. And so I gave him some birds, and then he had a friend that I gave some birds to. And um, then there's, so he has roosters, he has chickens. So that's right behind my house over that way. And then on the other side of the street, there's, um, they have a bunch of birds over there. And then if you go a block up, there's, they have a bunch of roosters and, you know, really? a bunch of chickens. And then a couple of houses in the back where I don't, I don't know where they are. You can just hear their birds always going off. So everybody out here has birds. It's kind of like the thing to that's do. That's interesting. I wonder why so many people are raising chickens. Uh, you know, I, actually, my wife was saying that um, she saw on Nextdoor, which is that app where people gossip about what goes on in your neighborhood, that basically since the pandemic, you know, most people have kind of like started hoarding birds and, you know, because mm -hmm. the food prices are going up and, you know. So for, primarily for the eggs, not for the birds themselves, right? Well, I mean, maybe they aren't, but, you know, like with mine, I'm going to, you know, I, I put a sign out there, like, just step out of line, you know, just do it one more time and you guys are going to be finding out. Yeah, you know, I guess, I don't know if, like, everybody harvests their birds for meat, but I, I have a ton of eggs, you know, that was primarily my yeah. my reason. No, I mean, I mean, it's, I just think that's really great because I, I just wouldn't expect you to be a chicken farmer. No, I mean, me neither. It's like, with all the things you've done and all the things you do and you have a master's degree in, in, in screenwriting and and you're raising chicken. Just, it started out really with worms. Raises. Yeah. Now they kind of raise themselves. I don't teach them too much, you know. The worms or the chicken? Uh, well, the worms are like 24 7 all, all the time on their own. I just feed them and, uh -huh. but I don't know. I got like really into like vermiculture for a while. And then like I was really into permaculture, vermiculture, any kind of culture, I guess, except for like cheese and stuff like that. But yeah, I was really into like, urban farming you know like that's always been kind of like a, a strong interest it's, of mine it's interesting wow it's really interesting so the closest i come to farming is going to the market and picking out stuff out of the produce section yeah you know that works that's my farming so. dude you know what's crazy okay so like i to feed my chickens there's a store to, there's a few different stores where i go and i i get their old produce but their old produce oh. is like a day old or like maybe they'll have like a bag of pears and one of them's bruised and they throw all this stuff in the garbage 
But if I, and I tell them like, oh yeah, I'm feeding my chickens with it. And they're like, oh cool, take all this old produce. So they're happy to give it to me if I feed my chickens with it. But if I went up there know. and I was like, I'm starving, I don't have any food. They, you know, they'd be like, beat it, get out of here. You know what I mean? What do you want? You want to eat this food? That's disgusting. You know, it's like, I don't know. It's so weird. I think that's just bizarre that they give it to my chickens, but they wouldn't give it to me. Well, I always thought, because my image of chickens is completely different than, than, than the hostile environment you described to me. Yeah, and, and they're from, scary. And that, that person I knew who had the, um, these big warehouses, like just big, coops and yeah. they all ran around i never saw it he just told me about it he just said it is the most disgusting thing you will once you've been around it you will stop eating chicken mine are free range so they're not in the coop very much you know like they get out early oh, and they're, they're, they're completely outside yeah right you know what's right. awesome is at night they just take themselves back into the coop like once i put them in the coop a couple of nights so like when i first got the i had to buy like some hens because i have I had two roosters and I only had one hen at the time. I originally had two, but one of them died. And then, um, so then it's like two roosters on one hen. It's just too much for that one hen. So I bought some other hens and they would just like hide up in the trees at night. And so I had to climb up in the trees every night, wow. pick them out of the trees, put them in the coop. I didn't know they could fly up into trees. I thought they were flightless birds. No, no, no. These, I have, we have like tall fences and these things, we were like, oh, like when we, cause we didn't know like how how high they could fly i'd never dealt with this particular breed they're phoenix they're like purebred phoenix so we we're like trying to corner them you know like oh get them close to the fence we'll corner them boom they just yeah. jump over it you know so then they're running down the street you know and i gotta go oh, outside man. and chase them down the street and it's this huge fiasco you know my neighbors that's how i met my neighbors and you know i found out about their chickens because they like helped me like wrangled the chickens together but they fly crazy high the other day actually i walked out there because one of the hens was making all kinds of noise and i go out there and she's on top of the coop just sitting there squawking away you know for whatever reason but yeah these ones can fly and i don't clip their wings you know but most of the time they just kind of hang out on the ground you know the yard board yeah the yard birds yeah. But, wow yeah they're they're pretty cool except for my one my one rooster squire he's a real dick you know so, yeah you know, well so. there's always one yeah you know he's, but, he's um, a top dog you know it's like one of those t you probably met those kind of people in the industry you know or yeah 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 well it's interesting because because they're a lot like birds are the no, even chickens they're a lot like us you know you put us in a coop with a lot of us together and we'll yeah. tear each other apart and, oh yeah it's like new york in there you know what i mean they're yeah. like all mad at each other yeah for sure it's amazing it's amazing but i, I love eggs and i love chicken but i don't I know. And you get too many alpha you. males, you know, you get too many alpha males like in one space and they're going to like, you know, they're going to go at it, you know, or like they kill each other to get the for the hens. They're combative, but, you know, there's definitely a, you know, they say a pecking order. So Squire, he's like my biggest rooster and he's like a classic like rooster rooster. He has like the tail and the comb and everything. And he's really, he regulates. I mean, he looks out for the hawks. And he's, you know, this is, he's, he's, He's actually a good rooster. We don't necessarily see eye to eye. I don't know for what reason. He kind of thinks I'm a threat, but um, he takes well, he care of all the hens. He's a Republican, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know what his deal <laughs> is. You know, he's Texas bed and born and bred, you know, so yeah. who knows. But, you know, he go he, the because I now I have a few roosters, So I, but I originally had two. And um, there's one rooster that kind of, I call him Billy, because, you know, he's named after Billy Idol. He's kind of a more of a, a rocker looking bird mm -hmm. and the hens don't really want to mate with him as much they want to mate with squire who's more of the alpha male probably tony soprano kind of yeah uh, you know he looks I mean? he's got the classic look too classic right? look yeah and um but all the different breeds it doesn't matter what breed yeah. of chicken it is oh. they only want to mate with him wow. but he's much more protective and he's he's bigger and so like he'll stand he stands and watches things while they eat like right at his feet yeah yeah and then and then like wow. he keeps an eye out for the hawks and everything and they're well, all what free do range. A hawk comes what do they do about hawks he makes like weird noises and then they duck under the trees you know so i have like some i have a couple of trees that are like they're almost like giant bushes they're really big so they you know they hang out under there and and then once the hawk leaves but we have a lot of trees in my neighborhood it's a lot of old growth trees so i was kind of park like actually but you'll hear all the birds all around the neighborhoods, just kind of squawking, going crazy, and then that's how I know oh, there's the a hawks hawk in the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hawks are crows. You know, wow. any any big 
And their so, hawks aren't so really. Do, or crows can aren't really a hawk grab a chicken and take it? Yeah, I mean they could take a bird. I mean a, a cat or whatever. You know they're oh, they're pretty. Okay. But my my rooster is he's probably like, I mean he's a big rooster. You know he's a yeah. he's big. And my my younger brother who's he's he comes over and just wrangles him up like no big deal. But I don't think he looks. My rooster doesn't treat my wife or or my brothers. Uh, you know the same way he treats me he's always like as soon as i turn my back he's trying to like come after me and attack me he's <laughs> real vindictive i don't know what his deal is it's like i don't know it's like you ever you ever been in like well you've been in like a corporate atmosphere you know what i mean where it's like yeah. you can't can't really let your guard down you got to keep yourself protected you know like you have to do things in such a way that you know this guy's going to undermine you or whatever you know it's it's just it's a vicious corporate atmosphere out there man well it's you were dark. telling me earlier that that somebody not too long ago was a woman was killed by one of the roosters that that mm -hmm. heck through her uh carotid yeah, not, or something yeah i'm not sure where it was my wife was telling me that you know some news thing that some one of her rooster wow. attacked her and cut her jugular and, and another guy he uh he got his like what is it that's on your thigh? What's the is that the um, carotid or artery right there on the thigh? Oh, well, I don't know what that one is, but whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that he he pecked at that and like you know he bled wow. out or whatever. Yeah, so I'm like always on guard because it's like he's the only he's the only rooster he's the only chicken that attacks me. First of all, actually, um, when the hens had their chicks when their chicks were little, the hens would come. She you know they would peck at me like super oh, crazy. Wow. They're real protective. It's very fascinating having all these birds. And well, do you have to wear special gear to keep from getting pecked? No, I mean I just well I have like boots and uh, you know like work boots and then I have like jeans on and stuff when I go out there. But yeah, um, you know I bring like a big rake with me just in case. Or if I have, I always oh. have buckets. I always have something in my hand so I can kind of keep them at bay. Now tonight I'm going to have nightmares about chickens attacking me but you know what's weird is i buy i buy chicken like when i go to the store i'll buy chicken to eat or you know and i'm like yeah. i got a fresh supply right out there I know, you know? But you don't like to kill them do you no uh -uh. i mean i haven't I've, I've i've had to dispatch some that were like when the hens were attacking the chicks i tried to save them you know as much as i could but like once you know that it's not going to make it it's just like just try to dispatch it as quickly as possible so it doesn't have to yeah. suffer Wow. But that's the only time I've ever done that, you know. It just seems like, uh, really, my my image of, of chicken farming is that they're these docile, kind of like ben benevolent or harmless little things that walk around on the ground, and you see them, and you, you just walk right past them. But you got you go out there, it's like a jungle. Yeah, it's they're like a chicken jungle. You know, it's like. So I bought like one of my hens is they, two of my roosters always go for the same hen. You know, like she's, uh, I guess, the hot one or whatever. Uh, and so the, her feathers have become bare on the back. You can see like her skin because they're, wow. they claw when they, and they rip it. They like, with their beaks, they hold the back of the neck as they're mating. It's pretty Ooh. vicious scene to see, right? And yeah. it doesn't always look like it's voluntary. You know what I mean? It's kind of a forced, you know. Wow. And so I bought my, um, I bought that hen, uh, like it's called an apron that like protects their back so their feathers can grow back. And they just went crazy on her. She was like running around the yard. Like they just kept peck pecking at it all the time. And like she had wow. to hide in like little spots. So I took it off because it was just like too crazy. Oh my goodness. Gosh, and, it's interesting yeah. all this. But chickens. Yeah, I it's no not. Idea. I'm going to eat chickens now without any guilt. Yeah, I don't have no any feelings guilt of guilt it. anymore. Those yeah. little bastards deserve to be eaten. Yeah, yeah. I put like, you know, barbecue sauce in their food and stuff like that, just so like that way I can get them sweet and tender. <laughs> there you go. Get them going. Good. I actually, this reminds me of uh, my my aunt had chickens before, long before I was born. And this may not be true, but she swears it's true that she asked her son to feed the chickens. And he went out there, and, and you feed him out of a sack sometimes. Mm -hmm. you don't you have chicken feed that comes out of a sack? Yeah, he yeah. went out there, and there was there were sacks of, of cement. Mm -hmm. And he put that in their food, thinking it was chicken food. And they ate him, and, and then she swears. And you tell me. Maybe this is impossible. Maybe they wouldn't eat that. But she says they came out, and they were all just, like, all stiff. All, <laughs> she just pulled your leg. She's lying, seashells. right? Yeah, she's yeah, lying. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I feed them seashells though. Like they eat little, like uh, I think they're, yeah, like little clam shells or something. 
I forgot oh, what is it's that, called. That's good for them? The yeah, I think it's like high in calcium. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, they're pretty interesting. Animals are just, you know, animals have their own strength. They have their own agenda. You know what I mean? I, I feel yeah. pretty comfortable with animals most of the time. But, you know, I've been, like, wildly attacked by dogs before. So, like, I have a respect for animals. I'm not going to be, like, grizzly man and try to pet a grizzly or anything. That's Yeah, yeah. They have well, their own space. I have a pet grizzly in it doesn't work out so nicely. Yeah. Or like walk. people who, you know, like have monkeys or, you know, things like that. Like monkeys are pretty vicious. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, that's the thing about all animals. I have a, a little dog and I have to walk it every day. And it will attack all the other dogs. Yeah. And it's a little nothing dog, but it is so mean. It is so sweet to me. It loves me. It's sweet. It rolls over on its back. They have his belly rubs and, and it's just sweet all the time. I take it out into the world where there are other dogs. And and I guess she's just jealous or protecting her territory. But she is just mean. Just mean. And I, it kind of just you know, disturbs me a little bit to see that. Because I think of her as this sweet thing. And is she good with other humans or is it just... Uh, she's good with other humans, yeah. Yeah, some dogs, dogs, like, they have to be, like... Like, when we first got our dog, the... People that we got them from over on uh, Sepulveda, as my wife said, Sepulveda. She didn't know how to pronounce it. Oh, so uh, <laughs> we, um, we, we, they said, oh, you need to like introduce your dog to like 50 dogs a week or something like that. And we're like, what? This is, I got a job. I have to like do stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it was like set up all these birthdays and stuff for my dog or whatever. But, you know, when you're out in the neighborhood, everybody's like, oh, it's a puppy. Like they're all excited. So we, we did end up. And we were, you know, walking around Larchmont and everything with the dog and everybody was all happy to like see the dog and everything as a puppy. So he got really like, um, uh, acclimated oh, exactly. to humans and, yeah, yeah, humans and dogs. And, you know, we well, took him to the dog. Maybe it's like my that. fault then. Cause I don't, I don't let her mingle enough. I'm, I'm not a good dog parent. You know, it's like, well, I didn't, we didn't know. I mean, we had no one told us that we would just be like, oh, okay, this is, you know, like we were so naive like I took him for a walk one time and I was like, Oh, it just doesn't seem like he's really into it. And it's like, well, I forgot the fact that like he's walking around barefoot basically. And it's like a hundred degrees outside. And, Ooh, like, oh yeah. You know, yeah. It's like little paws weren't ready for that yet. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of things, a lot of things about taking care of animals that we don't know. It's kind of like taking care of kids. I think like most, most parents when they start raising kids don't really know much about sure. kids, you know, yeah. and kids, yeah. It, like raising kids is a hard job it's really hard and and people don't have to qualify you have to qualify uh, you know for for almost any job in the in, in the world but not for pa being a parent and that's yeah. probably the, one of the hardest jobs you know, yeah you don't even have to have like a degree or like yeah. you don't have to have passed any classwork you can get you can become a parent for most people i mean they can become a parent with uh Almost no skill attached whatsoever, you know. Yeah, well, a little skill, like like you're good, you're good in a in conversation, and yeah, and you can be charming, and but you, you don't have to like there, know but... how to drive a forklift or deal no. with uh, airline attendants or anything like that. You can just become no. a parent, and then next thing you know, you have kids that mirror your experience yeah, in the world. That's what they do. They 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 end up looking at you as an example, and they become like you, and you go. I don't like that. And then you realize, wait a minute, that's me. You know? Yeah, totally. Oh, not good. Anyhow, well, we, we normally talk about show business. And as, as today we're talking about chickens. So yeah. Well, that's I'm a lot sorry, show I, just I just had chickens on my mind because you were told, you told me about this, this rooster attacking you. And I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I had no idea roosters attack people. Yeah. I, I, I knew they, they would attack other roosters when they were, they both want the same hen. I, I mm -hmm. just assumed that, but. Because, of course, we do that, too, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very competitive. It's very interesting, like, the parallels between human behavior and chicken behavior. You'd think they would be, like, wildly different. But if yeah. in, a, in a, you know, like, objectively speaking, like, you can see, like, oh, you get a bunch of alpha males together. They're going to try and impress the hens. The hens pick, um, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you are saying that, they go for the bad boy type, you know, the, the domineering yeah. bad boy type. Now, I know the woke culture or whatever probably would, 
you know, have something to say about whether that's real or not. But in, in nature, you know, they just do, they just follow this natural order. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, so I, I wonder how, it seems like the natural order for all animals has a, a lot of hostility. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how are we going to, we as human beings have to overcome that. The animals don't, but but we do. And, and we're not very good at it. And I think that's because it's kind of instinctive, you know, it's kind of there. But isn't that the draw of like why we, why we watch TV? I mean, I know that like our movies, it's people think it's because of the moral stories, but what makes it interesting is the conflict. And we, we are oh, yeah. drawn naturally Absolutely. to conflict. No, it is. We, we only watch for conflict. Uh, comedies, dramas, uh, it doesn't matter. Without conflict, people turn the channel. You know? Yeah. Just... So what would happen if everybody became so like, um, you know, so woke that none of the, there's no cultural problems, there's no race problems. There's it would be kind of a bland world. It I mean, I sad to say, world. yeah, I don't know. I yeah, I I just hope. Well, I don't think that we're going to get there anyhow. It's not certainly sure, not in my lifetime. Yeah, so, yeah. but but bland. It could get bland, but we we, we like then we could always race. We could race chickens to keep our lives interesting. So. Yeah. I mean, it's like we watch sports. That has a lot of conflict inherently. You know, it's one. Uh, oh, absolutely. Sports is a way to, to uh, sublimate in the, our desire to fight in, in you know, the combat. I mean, certainly football is obvious. Mm -hmm. But, but tennis? all sports, yeah, even tennis, even yeah. something like that, uh, it's all, com you know, combat. It's just in competition. Like you got to have winners and losers, you know? Mm -hmm. We have to have winners and losers. If, if nobody lost, there would be no game. So mm -hmm. every time I used to think, that, think about, uh, I get really excited when my team won, like in, in the World Series when the Dodgers won last year. Yeah. I was pretty excited about it. But then I felt bad for these teams that come in second or the, they don't even make the playoffs. I started thinking, yeah, because we had to beat their – kick their asses – to get to be the world champions and made me feel good and saying that all these people who feel bad because of that. But we have Just, like these, what are you know, losers? it's interesting because it's like, you can't be a sore loser, but you also can't be an over boastful, prideful winner. You know, it's like, yeah, you have to kind of yeah. like, there's a bandwidth there, but yeah, I mean, I think we naturally, like I watch a lot of UFC. I think UFC is pretty fascinating and I like martial arts and everything. Yeah. And I like UFC, like, but I, I don't, even though there's fighting in hockey, I don't like it in hockey because um, mm. I've seen a lot of people get blindsided in hockey and it just seems yeah. like a totally different type of, the thing I like about UFC is. Yeah, have, yeah. They face off. They yeah, face yeah, exactly. Off. They're there for They're that reason. For and yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're, you're a goalie and you look the other way and suddenly a, a it, stick hits you with a stick. Yeah. Head. That's craziness. Not I mean, cool. that's like a street fight. You know, and then even I mean, in that old joke, you know, that old joke that uh, the thing about hockey is it'd be better if there was uh, a less skating between fights. Was yeah, to go there for the fights, but but the truth is, uh, those are scary. Those are scarier because those mm -hmm. guys are really angry and fighting without the skill to deal with the fighting. But I don't. I, I watch boxing sometimes. Uh, big matches I'll watch sometimes, mm -hmm. and and I feel a little guilty pleasure. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy yeah, it. I can get the that. same time when these guys get bloody and 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 when somebody finally gets beaten, you know, somebody gets knocked out or something. This guy lying there, unconscious because of what somebody mm -hmm. else did to him, and we're all cheering that guy who's standing over him, raises his hands above his head. And, yeah, it's it's really weird, right? It's like very it's Roman esque weird, or something, but, you know. Coliseum but I like stuff. boxing. I just. I like boxing too. I actually wanted to create a sport called hoxing, which was like you just freeze over the boxing ring and put them on ice skates oh. and just have them go at it. You know what I mean? There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would be cool. I like that. I like Did you just make that up? Come on. That's I, you know, I, I, it's definitely something I've thought about before. But, you know, yeah. like the bread and circus, I think we're, I don't know if like this is really falls into the bread and cir circus paradigm, but I do think there is something inherent about, and even in screenplays, like, um, you know, I take any show. I mean, any show is about conflict. You know, any show oh, yeah. is about this person wants something and this person wants something, and you know they're gonna it butt heads. Until... Unless they oppose one another, there's no, there's nothing there. 
Yeah. I, 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 when I'm teaching, I've seen students write a scene where somebody walks in and says, would you like a cup of coffee? And the other person says, sure. How do you, how do you <laughs> like it? How black? You know, Great. How, and you're going, yeah. come on, somebody throw the coffee in his face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? then, then I'm going to be interested. Other than about the turn of the channel, if you just drink that coffee, um, or if somebody says, this is the worst shitty coffee, this is the worst thing I've ever, you know, then and the other guy gets defensive about it. Suddenly you get involved. But mm -hmm. two people just drink coffee and it's very real. Because I'll say, well, your scenes have to be very real and authentic. And they'll do a very real authentic scene of two people drinking coffee and talking. But unless they get into a conflict, nothing. Yeah. And then you have like that Harold Pinter style of writing where it's like, uh, you know, I'll take two sugars or something. And then that's like loaded with all kinds of backstory and you'll find out about that 20 pages from now and oh my god that two sugars was a huge lead into yeah. something terrible you know and, and but i don't you know I, I we talked about this before i watch a lot of like real housewives with uh whatever i like uh -huh. all the real housewives shows you like those shows i yeah they're facts i love but, those but shows. but you know those shows are, are like wrestling to me mm -hmm. uh i know they're fake I yeah. mean, you know, not entirely fake. Just like wrestling isn't entirely fake. These guys get hurt wrestling. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's it's a hard, it's a skill. Yeah. But we they already know who's going to win and who's going to lose and, right. and what, what bits they're going to do. Yeah. And it's like that with these these housewives too. They they give them scripted stuff, kind of mm -hmm. tell them they improvise a lot of it, but a lot of it is lines and stuff are thrown to them. It's yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, you know, I just think it's fascinating with the uh, housewives. You know, you get to see. Um, because they they have such high wealth, you know what I mean? They get affected by things also, you know, like you think, at least I used to think that wealthy people weren't affected by the ebbs and flows of the market or recessions. Yeah. They didn't have, but if you're paying, you know, X amount of dollars for X amount of thousands of dollars for a mortgage every month, you know, you're, yeah. you're going to feel that if the, if your house goes underwater, it's going to go underwater quick, you know? So yeah. it's very yeah. fascinating. Well, I had that happen to me. I, I, at the height of my career, when I was, I think I was on taxi and I, I was making a lot of money mm -hmm. and uh, I had a huge house. Not, I didn't, I never wanted a huge house in my life. Even afterwards, I tell you, it's not so great. I had, the house was so big that in the room we were watching television, the game room, mm -hmm. when a commercial would come on and you go down to the kitchen Mm -hmm. to get some food and come back. You couldn't make it to the kitchen and back before the show started again because the yeah. kitchen was so far away. It was such a big house. Yeah. Um, it was ridiculous, but my wife wanted it. So you um, didn't have, like, the idea when you were younger, like, oh, I want to – like, did you have any size mm -hmm. property in mind? I never thought about having a big property. I never thought about having a Rolls Royce, and, I, and I've had both now, and I didn't really enjoy either. Yeah. Um. You go, what's the big deal about this? This Rolls Royce is really hard to park. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really hard to drive. It's just a big, in back, back when I had it, they were big tubs. I mean, they were big, they're like boats. Yeah, yeah. Now they're, Still, now yeah. they're, they're, they're a little trimmed down a little bit more. They're, it does feel used. like a boat, though. It has like a very nautical style when you're inside. Yeah. The, you know, Those days when I worked on taxi, like for example, yacht. I'd work from um, 10 in the morning to about 3 in the morning, go home and sleep for six hours and come back at for 10 o'clock to start the next day almost every day even weekends almost so um, i mean that's the thing that like i think a lot of people don't understand about writing is you know but was that for all the staff writing staff or was that just primarily because you were the showrunner or was that even no, it was our whole writing staff yeah our whole writing staff but we had a small staff on taxi we only had uh four or five people mm -hmm. some of these shows have 12 some have more than 12 i've seen you know, I think I saw 20 ones on the show. I mean, that can't be right. They can't have 20 people. They must be part-timers or something. But we would get by with four people besides me, the showrunner and then four other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, That's a lot, though. I mean, that's I mean, that's very little people to come up with. Uh, what I meant was a lot. That's a lot of episodes to do with just oh, those yeah. four or five minds, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. It was yeah, hard. Freelancers I mean, that's, why we, that's why we couldn't get on. We didn't use freelancers much. Very, no? very. Oh, okay. Almost maybe one script out of out of the twenty two to twenty five we do a year. Yeah, maybe one or two, more like one. Did you have one, to rewrite the freelancers, or did they come yeah, in pretty solid? They were. We didn't have any good luck. All all our freelancers wrote crappy scripts. Hmm. Um, 
Is that because they weren't familiar with the show? They didn't understand like the nuance. They could just hit the mate. Like, I think that was part of it. I think part strokes. of it was they didn't understand the show, didn't understand us, didn't understand what was why it worked, didn't work. They just really didn't make a study of it. Most mm-hmm. of them, mm-hmm. and also because people don't realize this, but writing those comedies that seem like they're just silly little half hour entertainments are really hard to write. Mm-hmm. So mostly people just weren't funny enough, or they weren't dramatic enough. You know, they, they either couldn't they couldn't create a story to, that you cared about and would follow and or they couldn't do the jokes that had to go along with the story mm-hmm. it's it just really hard it's just really really hard thing we we just had no luck with freelancers when you um, were when you were doing yeah. that stuff was jim brooks like in the you know in the room with you guys or no jim brooks what jim brooks was at the time working on movies so oh, okay jim was with i could consult with jim Mm-hmm. That was a showrunner when I was a showrunner. Before me, it was Glenn Les Charles, and the same thing. We had consulted with Jim we, um, on phone, on the phone mostly, but also he'd come into his office and and he'd be available from time to time. Um, and I would just go in there and I would just run everything by him. I would just have everything I wanted to talk about, and I just you know like ram it down. The, the 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 system through the system and he was the system because he had to prove everything but it was really hard because he was so busy and um it was really hard it was a hard gig working taxi and but i loved every moment of it because i was a young man and it was my first show and though all i did was work all i did was work i i as i told you i'd go home to sleep and come back at 10 o'clock and work till three the next day yeah, and that's a typical schedule right that's like no pretty... it's not typical it's not no typical. okay no. even for like regular other shows that's not the norm mm-hmm. no oh, okay. cheers cheers would would come in at 10 and go home at six seven. Oh, that was like much more normal life M- much more normal mm-hmm. the problem with taxi was there were a lot of a lot of chefs and a lot of chiefs you know mm-hmm. who were making decisions because there was also ed weinberger was one of the executive producers <clears throat> And then the network wasn't really much involved. No, the network wasn't involved. The studio really wasn't much involved. It was primarily just trying to please Ed and Jim and very high standards for the show because the show, when I, when I started running it, had won every single year that we were on the air. We would won as best comedy. So mm-hmm. there was a lot of pressure to have to do another year of best comedy. You know, it just – so you, you couldn't settle for jokes, you know, some shows would say, okay, you need a joke here. A lot of people don't understand what jokes are. Jokes are the action and dialogue that make you laugh. It's not a joke like a setup and a punchline, setup and punchline. Right. So you are involved with setups, but the setups are long, story involved, and then the punchline plays off of that and mm-hmm. also has to be story involved. So they're not like telling a joke like, you know, um, a rabbi, a, a priest, and a and an uh, Indian chief are in a boat and it starts raining, you know, that kind of, it's not yeah. those kind of jokes. Yeah. So um, it was long hours because you'd write a joke and you just go, that's just not good enough. Mm-hmm. That's not good enough. That's, that's not going to, that's not a taxi joke. Did you feel you know, a lot of pressure? Struggle, struggle. Oh yeah. From like, cause Jim Brooks, I mean, I, I mean, explain a little bit just in case people who are watching aren't as familiar with Jim Brooks, you know, as he is now compared to like, who would you compare him to in today's, you know, right uh, pantheon? Well, probably Jim, Jim was, was so successful that there was no comparable person at the time. Uh, maybe going way back to tandem productions, which was um, Norman Lear, mm-hmm. Norman Lear, like had dominated comedies for a while. And then Jim came in, he dominated comedies for a while. And now Chuck Lorre kind of is that person. Chuck Lorre has always has shows on the air that are successful and really hasn't had any failures. So he just had Mom, which didn't do so well and was mm-hmm. recently canceled. Actually, I think it's, did that new show get canceled? The one that was the with the guy from, was it Afghanistan or Pakistan? or Not Pakistan. I can't remember what his yeah, new show yeah, is. Did that one get... Yeah, he did have something else that got canceled. But yeah, but pretty rare, never... I mean. Jim Brooks had never had anything canceled. Mm-hmm. Even even during the time I worked with him, except for one exception, we, which we didn't talk about, 
he's the one to pull the plug. When I did the Tracy Ullman show with him, mm-hmm. he's the one who decided we wouldn't do it anymore. The network didn't cancel us. And, and uh, even, you know, the ratings weren't great, but we were winning awards every, and, and it was a new network, Fox. And so they were thrilled to be winning the awards and nobody really cared whether we had huge ratings or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jim pulled the plug because he spun off the Simpsons from the Tracy Ullman show and the Simpsons started to make a huge amount of money instantly. Mm-hmm. Overnight, it started generating a huge amount of merchandising, which, which nobody was making money on before that. And, uh, and Jim was just too busy with his movies and, this, and the, the Simpsons. So he, can't, he just pulled the plug on it. He just didn't want to do it anymore. What was and the show that he had canceled? All of us, you know? what, was the, what was the show that he had canceled? The one that got canceled was called The Associates, and it was about uh, law associates who, mm-hmm. who, it was a law firm, and it was really smart and funny, and it had a lead woman who was, was funny, who was just gorgeous. She was this gorgeous blonde. Maybe she was too good looking to do comedy. Mm-hmm. Though there are some really pretty women who do comedy, but uh, there are. But anyhow, uh, this one was just really a knockout. It was like a pre Ally McBeal type of show, like that kind of thing. It, Ally McBeal was, yeah, I'd say it, in some ways it was like an Ally McBeal. I mean, Ally McBeal was a single camera, um, more more like short f- film mm-hmm. uh, presentation. And the Associates was just shot with multiple cameras with a live audience. So oh, okay. there's very few sets. Laugh track, which was not a fake laugh track the laugh track was from the audience there that was actually laughing. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so it, I've always had this feeling that the shows that aren't single camera never feel quite as real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Single yeah. Well, camera feels sense. very real. So, so the shows just didn't have that sense of reality or it, even though Ali McBeal took a lot of liberties with reality, it still felt real. Mm-hmm. And the associates didn't quite feel real. It felt like a stage play, which mm-hmm. is what, multiple camera shows look like so um well so so we were doing it's funny because we were doing taxi and taxi was the darling of the of television because we had been on for three years and we we had won the emmy for best comedy for three years mm-hmm. and then he jim brought in the associates and everybody loved the associates and it was get starting to get attention those of us on taxi were getting jealous Mm. We really were. We were just, Jim was spending too much time with the, the new baby, you know, mm-hmm. ignoring the other child. Uh, and Some we really felt rivalry. that. Yeah. We yeah. really felt that sense. And, and um, it was, it's funny. It's funny how that gets. You know, we wanted Jim's attention because we wanted Taxi to be the best it could be. Mm-hmm. And Jim was the best at that skill at that time. And now he was spending so much time with the associates. There were times he just wasn't available for us. Mm-hmm. It's just like a, it's just like a parent thing, you know. Mm-hmm. You get too busy with a bit newborn baby, and you can't right. spend time with the, the young toddler. Yeah, and um, and he did that. He they did that show, and I thought it was a really good show, and I I really enjoyed that show a lot. And uh, it didn't make it through one season. It mm. got it got canceled somewhere in the. Didn't get numbers. Didn't get following. Didn't get good ratings. Um, got good, did, got critical acclaim. Mm-hmm. Did get that. Got good reviews. Um, Do you think there's a, such a thing as too smart f- for TV? Yeah. I think yeah. there is. Not so much now because there, there's all these niche audiences that you can be really smart or very specific, very mm-hmm. um, uh, focused on one little area. But in those days, we we were broadcasting, so we had to get everybody in the country watching it, mm-hmm. and it's really hard because you know what a diverse country this is. Sure. Um, yeah. So all kinds of people. Um, I think it was too smart for television. I think people would watch it and go, I don't know. I just, I want to watch Laverne and Shirley cause I don't have to think so much. You know, mm-hmm. it just was easier to watch Laverne and Shirley trying to get a mule up the stairs because the boss is coming. <laughs> <laughs> you say it though, and it's like it actually sounds pretty funny. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, know. I could see the I appeal. Know. You know, you couldn't get you know, yeah. And, and, uh, and meanwhile, but on associates, 
in the, in the pilot episode, this gorgeous blonde, it was pretty interesting seeing because this, this one associate who was the newest associate, and she was actually a lawyer, this beautiful blonde. And he was an associate, mm-hmm. which is a new lawyer who just has no ranking yet. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, some of this, I'm saying it for somebody who maybe doesn't know. No, sure. I mean, um, this is actually news to me. I didn't know that. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm not that familiar with lawyers, to be honest. Oh, so anyhow, um, so he's madly in love with her. You know, she's just, she's gorgeous. She had one of those looks. She was like the perfect blonde. You know, I mean, she's a lot of fake blondes or, or blondes who try too hard or, mm-hmm. or, or they're too sexy or they're too whatever. She was just so pretty. And um, in the very first, or I think it was like the first couple scenes, he's in her office and she has to go to a dinner date. It's so right in front of him. She takes off her clothes and puts on her, like he's nothing. That was You know the, what? I actually think I remember it. that. Wasn't that like a big selling point for the show mm-hmm. at a certain point? I yeah, think I kind of remember that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I would remember that. That and you know, you pushing a mule that. up some stairs. Yeah, those are like those little sear into your memory. Well, there were no jokes and there was no story, but she sure took off her clothes. Mm-hmm. Well. Yeah, yeah. So but, that one I get. Yeah, but she she stripped down to her underwear. She didn't get naked. She but she, you know, really revealing. She stripped down to her underwear in front of this guy who had this mad crush on her, and she didn't even see him as a human being, certainly mm-hmm. not as a man. Mm-hmm. So it meant nothing to her to take her clothes off in front of him and continue to talk of the legal issue that they that they were dealing with. Mm-hmm. While she's taking off her clothes, and he can't focus anymore, but he's trying to, and he's keeping up with the legal things she's talking about, but she's redressing herself for a date. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was really interesting seeing, because, I mean, we've all had the experience with some beautiful woman who looks right through you like you're not even there Mm -hmm. that's what he was and it was real so really interesting scene and i don't remember anything else about the show (laughs) (laughs) well maybe Um, that's uh maybe it peaked right after that you know people couldn't they're like get back to that one scene you know no actually it was martin short who who was playing the associate so he was really good yeah martin short what a career that guy's had yeah and he was very young then and Mm -hmm. he was playing the associate he was so young um, but the show was really smart because it had real, it had legal situations. They had to talk some law. Mm-hmm. Um, they were smart people because they were successful lawyers, and it was a very prestigious firm, which is so it was hard for him to become an associate. So everybody in the place was really smart. Mm-hmm. That's probably a thing that turned a lot of people off because um, everybody was smart, everybody was good looking. And, and well, Martin is cute, not good looking. I think people would think. It, He's kind of one of the, those cute characters. You mm-hmm. know? Uh, Do you think it didn't have a solid everyman? You know how like... Um, it didn't have an everyman. Okay, like like Woody from Cheers or, you know, somebody no. that you can kind of... No, I mean, obviously, Woody uh, you can't really relate to, but you know what I mean? Uh, you know, at least he's... I can relate to Woody. Yeah. Sometimes I feel stupid. You ever you hear people say, how's it feel to, to know you're always the smartest person in the room? Mm-hmm. Well, I no, I've never heard that, so <laughs> I've had that issue. No one's ever said that to you? Uh, nah. But I know what it's like to feel like you're the stupidest person in the room. Sure, yeah, okay, that I can relate to. I've worked with uh, really top writers, and sometimes you're just looking at these people with reputations. When I was very young and I first started, these people have reputations, and they won awards, and they're, they're talking, they know exactly what they're doing because they've done it for so long. And I felt like the stupidest person in the room. I, I mm-hmm. have had that feeling, and... And, uh, but I mean, when you're like around a bunch of heavyweights, you know, especially if you're new, it's got, it's always intimidating. It's always intimidating writing in general around other people, not the actual typing, because that's not usually done around other people, but the idea sharing and, you know, articulating vague concepts in your mind that you're trying to build, you know, build out with other people that can be very intimidating because it's such a at least in my experience you know and and i i I feel comfortable in those environments but i feel like um if somebody critiques my things too early it's such a derailer because it's like i haven't nailed down the concept yet i don't feel comfortable with it and then somebody comes in with like a little piece of information and whether it's relevant or not if it just veers too far left or too far, you know, if they're not understanding where I'm going, cause I haven't necessarily honed it yet, then it, 
I, yeah. I tend to like want only, I really only kind of want feedback once I'm feeling, you know, somewhat confident about the, the presentation of the idea. Well, I'm so, with all the years I've done, I still feel that way. I, I prefer to write alone yeah. because I can, I can do my bad draft. I can do my, right. my, um, uh, process where it's not there yet, but I know it's going to get there. Sure. When you're in the room, you can't really do that. you you got all these brilliant people and so you're pitching ideas. When I first started on taxi, I'd only pitch, I'd only speak up when I had something I thought was absolutely surefire. Right. I wouldn't throw out the ideas that were maybe starting to brew and develop. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, they liked that about me because I didn't interrupt the room. We actually had some other, uh, nov not novice, I guess we were novice writers, but some new writers. They used to call them baby writers. Baby writers, yeah. They still, I think they still call them baby writers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, who would just constantly throw out their ideas, boom, 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 and interrupt other people, not interrupt people, but fill up the space so somebody else can't talk. Mm -hmm. And their ideas weren't very good. They were underdeveloped, mm -hmm. and they didn't make it through the first season. They were moved out oh, um, yes. and then fired. Mm -hmm. um, though the funny thing about show business is people don't get fired. They just get a new deal. They, you know, well, well, he left because he had this great opportunity to work on this other project mm -hmm. and it's always lie because your agents always say that so these guys left i won't say who their names are but they left taxi having failed there but their agent said they decided they did so well at taxi that they were moving on to do their own things spend some time with family and everything <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's a, a spin on it right? their own projects and Right. Uh, decided that, that they had creative differences and all that, all that, mm -hmm. that nonsense talk, um, and actually got other deals based on people believing that that they had done so well at taxi, they wanted to move on and up. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to stay in that position of being on the on the staff. Right. And these guys actually did much after taxi. They just kept succeeding, and man, it's very strange. But um. Yeah, how people perceive you sometimes more important than what you can actually do or what you actually deliver. But There's a lot about that. life, though. Yeah. Yeah. In, in all businesses, it's mm -hmm. true. There, there is that. When we were talking about the, the late nights with Taxi, um, yeah, it was because we wouldn't settle. We wouldn't settle for jokes that would work. We wouldn't settle for story twists and turns that mm -hmm. would work. Yeah. Because they had to be better than anybody else. We had to be the best comedy, best show best half hour on the air and to do that you'd always say um i don't know barney miller's going to do lines better than that let's keep mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. and so we would be there every single day from i mean i'm not exaggerating 10 in the morning to three in the morning um and it, it seems like it can wear you down but it doesn't because there's something exciting and fun about it even mm -hmm. when it's really hard Mm -hmm. And I can tell people that, you know, people who say, well, I don't know, boy, it's a lot of hours. I don't want to work that many hours. Well, if you have, if you have a family, I don't know how you do it. I was single. Mm -hmm. You would never see your family. So I don't know how you do that. If you had kids and a wife, people that who, who want to see you and spend time with you, because we just go home to sleep and come back. Mm -hmm. And we were all single. Everybody on that's everybody on our staff, at that time, was single when I was running the show. And we would just stay there forever. Did they have the show broken? You know how, like, now they really weigh everything based on 18 to 24 demographic. Was it heavy, you know, conversations like that at the time? Not to us. But just we had to be the best comedy. So mm -hmm. All they said, and have a, a huge um, rating. So we had to... Uh, have the, the breadth of of the whole country you know the, that it had to be that wide that it was accessible to everybody and same time be better than what anybody else is doing I mean, that's a tough order yeah that's a really tough order like, here's a joke you do a joke oh that's funny but it's too sophisticated or it's too too smart and a lot of people are not going to get it so we can't do it don't do how, it how is the room divided like you know at, you were saying that, this is 
cream soda. I don't want anybody to think I'm drinking uh, <laughs> whiskey here. So, all right. Um, it, it, <laughs> how did you? How is the room divided in terms of age and and experience? You know, because you said you were around twenty four, twenty five. Yeah, I was very young. I was twenty five. When I was running the show, I was 27, 28. Mm -hmm. uh, it's under 30, um, though. I mean, that's... Yeah, I was under 30. But I, I was up there, my high 20s. Mm -hmm. um, but we had people, other, some younger than me, just a little younger than me, uh, and some, some guys in their 50s and 60s. Uh, we See, had David, David Lloyd, who probably was 60 at the time. Um, he didn't stay late. David had a great thing. Because David had a family and a wife and, uh, and responsibilities or pleasures he wanted to pursue beyond writing. He'd been writing for so many years by then. It wasn't enough to keep him happy and, and right. entertained. So his deal was he got to go home at midnight, no matter what condition we were in. Mm -hmm. If the show was still in really bad situation at midnight, he still got to go home at midnight. Never stayed beyond midnight. And at midnight, you know, you know, it would be struggling on a joke or a scene or something. He'd say, see you later, guys. He always thought it was kind of fun and funny. That at midnight, he walked out. And in those days, this is like, this is taxi is something like, gosh, how many years ago would that have been? Let's see, if I was 25, about 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. David Lloyd, 40 years ago, was making $10,000 a night. Mm-hmm. So what would that be in today's money? I don't know. They don't do that anymore, though. They don't pay these super. He's jokes. making fifty grand a week, sixty grand a week. Oh yeah, no, he would. He would only come in for us one night a week. Oh, okay. Well, still ten. He, that's forty grand a month. Ten grand for it. He he come in for us one night a week, and he come in for another show one night a week, and he come to another show. So he probably had three shows going always. Oh and really? Come in just one night, but every he come in. And he'd come in late. He wouldn't come in at 10 o'clock with the rest of us because at 10 o'clock, we're working on next week's show mm -hmm. and, and editing of the previous week's show. We're, we're doing a lot of things at, in the early part. He would come in after the run-through. The run-through is where the actors actually run through the existing script, that, whatever condition it's in. Mm -hmm. He would see that, say, at 3 in the afternoon, and then come in and sit down, what is it, 4 or 5, and go home at midnight. And got ten thousand dollars every time he did that. But he was he was like a punch up writer, right? Like he did just jokes. primarily jokes. He wasn't. Did he mess with the just story jokes. structure at all, or just unless it had something to do with the joke itself? No, just jokes. Wow. And um, he was probably the funniest guy I've ever known. He just could. You could you could give him a subject or a thing, and he would just boom. There's the joke. Mm -hmm. Give another story. Boom. There's the joke. And just an amazing guy. So in terms of, of the rarity of his talent, I guess it was worth whatever $10,000 a night would be today. I guess that would be like like $100,000 a night. You know? mm -hmm. That's crazy. And, and he, just for, just for a regular eight-hour day, you know, from four to midnight, what's that? Yeah, it's about eight hours. And what's his son's name? That he was in um, Modern Family. Christopher Lloyd. He created okay. Modern Family. He ran and he created him as a showrunner of Modern Family. I just always get him confused with the other Christopher Lloyd. Yeah, the actor. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's interesting that Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd, and then there's the actor who was on Taxi. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I always get him intermingled. Like yeah. Yeah, a little intermingling, but no relation, David, right? No, no relation. Yeah. But David was. Um, was just an amazing joke man, amazing joke man. So you could focus more on your story. I could focus on the story, make sure you trying to get the story right. Because if we got the, then you, there, there is, there's a sense of you can go so far with story development before you have to have a laugh. Mm -hmm. So when we'd go this far with the story, and then we'd learn to David, and he'd give us a laugh, and we'd go on, mm -hmm. and he'd give us a laugh. And I don't mean, it wasn't always David. Everybody was pitching, so... It wasn't always David who had the, the joke and the laugh that got in. Mm -hmm. It's just he had, he would pitch three jokes to every joke anybody else pitched, mm -hmm. you know. And um, did his jokes ever change the direction of the story? Like, you know, you're, you're like, oh, now we can play off of that because this character, you know. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. 
But here's the interesting thing about David's jokes. The, sometimes they'd work very often, but half the time they wouldn't work mm -hmm. in the show mm -hmm. because he's very funny and he's very uh, instantaneous. And he also was like, it was like improv for him. So mm -hmm. sometimes it would work in the room just because he could come up with them so fast and they were so appropriate and he delivered them with such great style that we would in the room would laugh or we would go, Oh, that's a great joke and put it. But about a half of them didn't work when we would actually get to the stage and have the next run through the next day, about half of them just fall out and he's not coming back again. He's only there for the one day. So now we're there fixing jokes of his that didn't work. But that's crazy though. I mean to be that high paid but fifty percent of your output isn't going to hit the mark you know that's still that's that's what the comedy world was like the the strange thing about when you write half hour comedy you make more money than people who are writing hour dramas mm -hmm. oh and i didn't know that. that is it what i didn't know that oh yeah so so dramas pay less than comedies uh like half hour comedy paid almost as much for a script as a whole hour of a drama mm. um and the, the writers themselves were, were at a higher level of pay in the comedy world than they were in the dramatic world as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is we had to be able to do drama and comedy both. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Where the dramatic writers only had to do drama. Mm -hmm. And then there were comedies like, I don't mean to demean it because it's very successful, but say like Laverne and Shirley, mm -hmm. where they didn't worry about the drama. It was all just comedy. Mm -hmm. So... But, but shows like Taxi and Barney Miller and MASH, and those were the classics during those days. Mm -hmm. um, we had to do drama and comedy constantly. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you had to have two skills. So it made it even rarer to find somebody who could do those. And then it was harder work because you had to be able to satisfy people dramatically and, and comedically. Where on the Vernon Shirley, you just had to make them laugh. You put the mule up the stairs, could take 10 minutes, you know, almost mm -hmm. after your show. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one where your back's up to the mule's ass, pushing it up, and mm -hmm. the mule farts, and it just. It, we used to laugh at the, the Cosby Show sometimes. Uh, would literally they would just dance and mug and wink and do funny faces and stuff, for five straight minutes without a joke. Yeah. Just, then he's dancing funny. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah. And his voice and <laughs> yeah, and you're like. Man, there's no jokes there. There's no, there's no drama there. This is a guy just mugging for the audience, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it worked better than anybody. That was the top show on television for a long time. I wonder what happened to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's amazing. But, um, you know, one of the reasons I asked you, like, what the demographic was, the spread, and the – because if you're, if you're trying to appeal to a broad audience and you don't have that experience of having – families yet because you guys are all single and you know how do you bridge that gap you know and how do you know like what middle america is thinking versus the coast you know well well for one thing we did have david lloyd's and we mm -hmm. did have jim brooks and ed weinberger who were older and married mm -hmm. so <clears throat> it was just the the core <clears throat> excuse me it was the core writing staff that was not married but mm -hmm. But we did have married people around who, who would uh, speak up about such. But also, you know, we're all well informed. We watch television. We watch the news. We read. We read mm -hmm. the news. Uh, we pretty much know what's going on in the world and in Middle America and what. And what. You, you know if a joke is very, very um, um, show business kind of joke, that's not going to reach people don't understand show business is going to reach mm -hmm. those people in Hollywood or LA or New York or Chicago, maybe, but middle America might not get those jokes that are, that are um, reference jokes about show business, for mm -hmm. example. So Two those are baseball. You just know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's, we just, a lot of it was guesswork, but we also had um, um, a uh, research department. So mm -hmm. when you wrote a script, it had to go through the research department before it got to the people who would actually deal with the script. So say um, 
a, a freelancer wrote a script. When it was all done and turned in, it was not only turned into the showrunner and the executive producers, it was also turned into the research uh, department. And the research department would send back notes saying, well, this reference is wrong, that reference is wrong, this is grammatically incorrect, this, mm -hmm. this is uh, factually incorrect. And, and, and so we had that, that was very helpful. Do you think it made a difference that the shows that you were writing weren't primary? It wasn't like a Cosby show. It wasn't a staircase show. It was a basically not family oriented show. I mean, it was, you, you can yeah. relate to the characters in a way that, you know, cause they're young and they're also like, you know, I think I could have written a family show. I, I, I really think if you think about yourself, even when you were very young, mm -hmm. um, like in your, you know, 20, 21, 22, as I said, you, you're, if you want to be in show business, you're pretty well informed about everything. You just want to, part of the reason you, you're the kind of guy who wants to write scripts is because you always got your nose in everybody else's business or in the world's business. And what. Sure, yeah. But we pretty much knew. We pretty much knew it. I mean, I wrote for women. I mean, I wrote stuff for Elaine. I've never been a woman or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or had an insight on that. But you just... This is new. And sometimes you make mistakes and somebody has to catch you on it. But mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things I, I'd write. I wrote for old people. I wrote for, for people of, of, the, of another gender. Uh, I wrote uh, for gay people. I, you know, you write for people. You don't, you don't know the experience, mm -hmm. but you know about the experience well enough to, to make it feel authentic. Mm -hmm. when you write about it and if and if, and if you don't know you ask i mean yeah, that's I, I never had a problem with that mm -hmm. if i didn't know something about how somebody how a woman might feel in this situation with with her boyfriend or whatever mm -hmm. i i would ask i might go to to mary lynn or i might go to you know one of the, the actresses say okay we're writing the scene you know blah 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 how how would you react to that and she'd tell me and it wouldn't necessarily be funny or great dramatically but it would give me a real sense of what's authentic mm -hmm. and right. we would go back to the room and, and write it, add the stuff that make it funny and being consistent with the things she felt like there was an episode where Louie really interesting episode where it was, I think it was called Louie goes too far. Mm -hmm. And what happened was Louie drills a hole in the wall so that you can see the women in, the, in their, in the restroom, in the women's room. Um, and that was why he went where he went too far. And Mary Lou was saying, you know, that's a violation that you 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 can't understand. When you find out a guy's been watching you in in, in, in bathroom activities, bathroom, you know, I guess activities, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, she says it was a violation. It was hard to explain, mm -hmm. but but to me, it didn't seem as offensive. It's like, yeah, you want to tell the guy, knock it off. Uh, maybe reprimand them or something, but I didn't. I wouldn't feel violated by mm -hmm. that. You know, mm -hmm. whether it was a woman or a man or anybody had seen it, I'd just say, "What the what the fuck has been wrong with you?" But I do wouldn't. You, I was going to ask, do you think that's because in um, culture overall, like we were much more accustomed to seeing men in the restroom at different in different ways you know that's something that happens yeah. fairly often through westerns through mm -hmm. uh, bar type shows you know like uh, animal house you know you see these kind of jokes happen yeah you know Once they start doing it more with women uh, that show girls they'd be sitting on the on the toilet you know having a bowel movement you know yeah like, who wants to see that but there it was yeah so uh, things have changed i mean that's why I say you got to keep up with it. So you watch that show, even though it was not a show that I particularly liked, mm -hmm. but seeing that show, it gave me some insight into what young women were more interested in because the show was just doing well with young women. So mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to keep pretty well informed. If you're, if you're doing a show, uh, a smart show, a quality show, you have to watch other shows and you have to read, you know, mm -hmm. And watch. You got. You got to stay aware. Right. Excuse me. So um. So uh, the late nights were just were really um. Every once in a while we'd finish something. We'd finish the night at say seven eight o'clock, and I didn't know what to do with myself. Oh really? 
yeah, it's like eight o'clock at night and I don't, I'm not working. What am I going to do? Where I don't have any, um, I can't just call up a friend because I, I haven't been keeping in touch with my friends. I don't mm-hmm. know what to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. Where, where, so maybe we'd, we would just hang out in the, in those days there were video machine uh, um, arcades. We'd go play video machines or, or we'd go out and eat or drink and still stick with each other, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, what would you do? You know, it's a very great, my life, my life on taxi. And that sounds like a, a series. My life on taxi mm-hmm. was just taxi. Where were yeah. you guys working? What part of town were you in? Paramount Studios in Hollywood. Oh, over in Larchmont. Yeah. Area. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, they, they would bring our food in. We would eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. Mm-hmm. And they go to any restaurant you we wanted. Things have changed now. The bud now there are budgets for food and stuff. And I told you, you know, and David Lloyd was making so much money and all these things were for comedies. Comedies were king then. Yeah. We would order lunch and dinner from the best restaurants in town. Mm-hmm. And and our refrigerator was always full of uh, all kinds of goodies. Uh mostly snacks and the freezer was full of ice cream and real and, healthy <laughs> you know did a lot of people gain weight on the show or are you just too stressed yeah, out people would, gain weight and people would get a lot of coffee drinking mm-hmm. there's always always several pots of coffee out it was just kind of like but it was that was your world oh, okay all right almost my life yeah and 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 honestly sometimes when we wouldn't have work a weekend I would love it. It was like a holiday. You know, I told you the other one. Sometimes when you finish early in an, in an evening, you yeah. didn't know what to do. But on, on a weekend, like you knew you had a weekend, you could catch up. You, your laundry was this high because you hadn't, you couldn't even send your laundry in. You didn't right. do it yourself. You couldn't take it in anywhere. And um, and you'd go, you go see family to say hello again to them. Yes, I'm still in the world, um, and you're still in the world. Yay! You know. And, mm-hmm. You know, set little celebrations and uh, just a relief of not having to think of funny things one after another. And then Monday would come around and boy, you're right back in the trenches and not hating it. That's mm-hmm. the weirdest thing. You don't hate it. Yeah. You know you're working really hard. You know it's a little bit crazy. So a lot of so a lot of ageism that goes on now is some of it's based on reality. A lot of isms are based on reality that get pushed out of proportion. Mm-hmm. Ageism is the reaction to the fact that when you're single, you will work and do nothing but work and right. not complain. Mm-hmm. Once you're married and start having family, you say, I have, I'm married and I have a family. I have sure. to do other things. So I understand why they're attracted to young people but the, the difference is I can now, I could run a show like Glenn Les did it for Cheers. I could run a show that works from nine to five. Mm-hmm. It's doable. And Cheers was, ended up being the best, you know, Cheers actually remembered more than Taxi. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Glenn Les would not work those crazy hours and, and they had wives and Neither it's a smart kids. show. It's kind of just considered a smart show. Has Here's some of the smartest one. characters of all time, you know, like Frasier yeah. and whatnot, you know. But, you know, Glenn Les were interesting because they were Mormons mm. who didn't practice the Mormon, like they did drink coffee, then they smoked cigars. In fact, they didn't do anything Mormon. <laughs> Not mm. anything about it. But, <laughs> um, but they did have, both had wives, but they didn't have children. They both, they both were members of Zero population growth. Hmm. I don't know if it's still around, but there was a group called Zero Population Growth when everybody w- believed that the planet was becoming overpopulated mm-hmm. and people should not have children or just have one child. Right. You know, in China, that became a law, but it, but there were people in this country who were trying to organize people to not have children. Huh. And they were both in that. Really? So neither Glenn or Les had children. So it kind of made, it freed them up a little bit because you know, having children is a lot of responsibility. Mm-hmm. So I see that a little bit, a bit of why there's some truth that age is a factor. Mm-hmm. 
But then the other side is once you've become so experienced that you can do the same things that used to take you all day to do, you can do in, in a 10 hour day that used to take you 24, you know, well, not 24, but, but, but an 18 hour day. Mm -hmm. Now you can do it in a 10 hour day, the same just as well, because you just know better. You just know what not to do. You know what to do. You just direct yourself better. So there's two things. You either get somebody who's a novice who will work and do nothing but work or get someone who has experience who can do it in less time. Right. Either one works, mm -hmm. but they've the business has wiped out the experienced guy. They don't want the experienced guy. Mm -hmm. They only want the young ones. And one of the, prob one of the reasons for that, as they say, is that the young people are not comfortable especially if they're a showrunner or they're high up with the older people more than that older people aren't comfortable with the young people. Mm. That's what they tell us. So they said, we hire all these young people because they'll do nothing but work mm -hmm. and they take less money. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the bigger thing is they take less, less money. money. Yeah. Yeah. Less, yeah. And, um, and so we prefer them that they don't say this out publicly because it's, it's illegal to, to Mm -hmm. age, you know, right use ageism but but that um it it makes some sense on some level but they discard the fact that see, i worked when i was a young man on taxi and i worked great with david lloyd i thought david lloyd was was so cool mm -hmm. and so funny and smart and fun fun to be around i had no problem with the fact that he could have been my grandfather mm -hmm. He wasn't like my grandfather. My grandfather wasn't that funny, witty, mm -hmm. brilliant writer. Mm -hmm. And so I got along great with David Lloyd. I got along great with Jim Brooks. And Ed, well, Ed Weinberg was kind of confrontational and difficult. So it was kind mm -hmm. of hard for anybody to get along with Ed Weinberg. I but that could have been at any age, right? I mean, it doesn't, yeah, if you're yeah. confrontational and difficult. But that's what I, I think. They should talk to people who have the experience, talk to us about it. Yes. Young people can work with older people. If the older people are cool, mm -hmm. if the old person is the kind of person who will say, hey, sit up straight. You're not sitting up straight. Of course you don't want to work with that guy. That is your grandfather. Your right. Father. Yeah. But, but we were just like them. You know, they want to drink a lot of coffee and get hyper to write these jokes. You know, some did drugs. I never did. But, but some, you know, there are people who did, you know, did coke or something. And it wasn't a lot on Taxi. Taxi was a pretty clean show. So mm -hmm. was Cheers. Yeah, we really, you know, I, I didn't really see any drugs in, in those shows, but I've worked on other shows where people might have used something. I just had a question about Cheers because is is that not a live working bar, or is that those are fake? Because they you can't deliver those lines all the time and be drinking throughout the show. You get I would get tired. I mean, if if I drink, oh, I, I would drink in years. Beer? But yeah, oh yeah, they're drinking tea. Oh okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, but I did and carbonated. I mean, if if to, yeah, it's all fake. No, nobody was drinking real, real liquor. No, it okay. was a working bar. There was a, there was a, a, a tap so you could do near beer. You know that beer mm -hmm. that's not has no alcohol. Right. Think, so the taps work and things work, so it all looked authentic, but none of it was real alcohol. But I heard during the finale that they were all drinking on the show. So there was probably I don't know. People didn't talk about it. Sam Simon used to take a Coke can and dump out all the coke and pour bourbon or something. I don't remember what his favorite drink alcohol was. He'd pour something in there that he really wanted. Yeah. And he'd walk around on the stage with a can of coke, drinking from it, and nobody ever said anything. He was drinking alcohol. But was he not, he wouldn't get belligerent or anything? Or Oh, he got belligerent all the time. <laughs> that was his nature, though. So nobody, nobody thought it was a liquor. Oh, okay. He never got, stat, you know, staggering drunk, you know. It was never a like drunk yeah. drunk. Yeah, yeah. He just liked to have a little alcohol when he was on the stage to calm him down, I guess. Cause a lot, it's, there's a lot of pressure sure. when you're shooting because when you shoot with a live audience and the audience doesn't laugh, when, when, you're doing, when you're not doing a live audience and you write something, they just shoot it Yeah, because that's it. When you have a live audience and you shoot it and the audience doesn't laugh, you don't put it in the can. Everybody has to gather and, and rewrite that scene on your feet, standing, right? Oh, there. really? On the spot? Right on the spot. You got to write the fix those jokes that didn't work. Fix that, that dramatic moment that didn't that didn't take. And it's a lot of pressure. Quick, right now, right now. The audience is sitting there, so you can't take a long time. Plus, 
all the people on the show are, are, are getting paid by the hour. Everybody except the, you know, the, the above the line people, the actors, the, the writers, the directors, we're getting our, you know, our fees, but yeah, we're getting hourly pays and they go into golden time and, and uh, something, something else more than it's more than golden time where they're paying three times what the normal per mm-hmm. hour or whatever. So you're under the pressure of getting it done. Mm-hmm. And you, the audience isn't going to sit there forever while you're trying to think of better. So you're thinking of jokes fast to replace those jokes that don't work. And you're thinking of the, the dramatic, and then you feed those lines to the director who feeds them to the actors, and then you reshoot the thing right in front of the audience. So I always wanted to do single camera because you just write the best thing you think you could write. It seems to be good. Everybody thinks it works. So you just shoot the thing, and nobody's. You don't have those judges. You don't have the, the 300 judges in the stands telling you it didn't work. So you have to fix it right now on the, on the spot. That's interesting. That's something that I didn't know too much about. I mean, um, so is that, would David Lloyd be around for those moments? Is, is that a, no. So <laughs> the, the one guy David that. didn't want to do those things. So David only pressure, did one huh? night a week when we're sitting in the office with the, with the nice food and the. Yeah. And okay. And. He could drink a beer there if he wanted. Um, um, yeah, no, he didn't do those. Those were the hardest. The thing, I, the only thing I don't think I ever enjoyed was that instant rewriting on the spot, on the set, in front of an audience. And then we'd shoot the thing again, and now the audience would hear new lines, and they'd go, where the, where the fuck did those lines come from? Mm-hmm. And all oh, these actors had thought up some new stuff, you know? They always thought it was the actor. You know, it just amazes me how many people think the actors write their own stuff. Right. Um, but in terms so, of the actors, like they have to deliver that line as if they'd already rehearsed it, you know, because they're also under a lot of pressure to oh, make sure that, that line pressure. delivers because they don't want to start Absolutely. the whole process over again, right? Yeah, you give them a new line or sometimes there'd be several lines set up. They got to memorize those lines instantly. Mm-hmm. They got to block it. The director has to block it for the cameras again. And if there's some different movement or the timing is different on the joke, right? A lot of people are just, are just under the gun. It's a shooting a live show is a terrible thing. I did <laughs> not like that. That's the only yeah. thing I didn't like about, about television. Shooting a live show was very stressful. Um, very stressful. Well, I very, guess now is a good time to. Pleasant tell the audience that we're going to be shooting live next week so they should stay tuned in and <laughs> yeah, yeah. enjoy the podcast then right. yeah no, so we, that actually shows your the heightened level of professionalism at that time it's like you're you're because you have to keep it's not just is it just the joke and you you you're not restructuring the story or is it did you have to sometimes restructure the story as well under those moments Usually it was just fixing lines. Usually mm-hmm. it was a dramatic line that didn't work or a comedic line, mostly comedic lines mm-hmm. that didn't get laughs. Um, very little actual restructuring. Though sometimes you had to restructure scenes. Sometimes you could tell the scene wasn't working or the joke or the drama you're trying to add requires mm-hmm. some restructuring of the scene. So it was just, it was instant writing under a lot of pressure with everybody looking at you. The network's there, the studio's there, the, your bosses are there, the executive producers are there, and this line that you thought was going to work, the audience doesn't laugh. You go, oh, mm-hmm. shit, here we go. Yeah, you it's know, the worst time Everybody's to watching us. Everybody's, you know, we're on the spot now. Now when we do this replacement line and we run it, if the audience doesn't laugh again, Everybody's really going to be upset because now you now you've wasted a lot more time, and you got to do it again, and uh, that's a hard that's the hardest part of it. And, and I never liked it. Never liked doing the show. Would it be but sometimes about the show? The one thing I liked about the show was the stuff that did work. Yeah, the laugh and stuff you wrote that that it did work. The laugh felt good. The drama, but you always knew. You probably aren't going to get through that scene without a couple things not working, and then you mm-hmm. got to think instantly mm-hmm. of, of what to put in there. Was it sometimes the delivery, like that? It just wasn't. You know how, like, you can have an inflection or you can mm-hmm. have an attitude that really sells the joke. If you missed that mark or the timing of it, 
you know, would you have sometimes to? Sometimes it was that. And sometimes yeah. it was the actor didn't deliver the line right, mm-hmm. or um, um, but most often because we had already done rehearsals, so we the actors knew how to deliver the lines. They knew what line we wanted to deliver. Mm-hmm. So, but somebody might say when the audience didn't laugh, maybe we had always thought maybe it would work better this other way with a different attitude mm-hmm. and you can just pitch an attitude that would be an easier fix you know mm-hmm. okay okay mary lou instead of saying this like you're angry at him say it like you're teasing him mm-hmm. uh, you know and she's like okay i got it and you do the same line again with a different attitude that's an easy fix mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. usually they were the line this joke does not work All right. i does not think this is funny wow connect with them for some reason we connected with ourselves. We thought it was funny when we wrote it. We thought we were very careful to present the best joke we could present, not just any joke. The moment, mainly it was jokes. Mm-hmm. The joke did not work. The moment you expected a laugh, did not get a laugh. And mm-hmm. you got to do it. You got to do it again. And I was going to, I wanted to ask you a question too about um, associates, because you were saying that was done in front of a live audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but I th- were we was, did you say that there was like an animal mishap or something like that on one of those shows yeah and- one time yeah i didn't actually see it because i wasn't it wasn't my show but they were shooting on a stage right next door to us so i i just learned about it that yeah this guy gets in the back seat of a of a cab and he he's gonna sh- he wants to share the cab with the person who has the cab mm-hmm. and when he gets in there it's an ape Okay. A orangutan or a chimpanzee. I don't remember which it was. A live it was one. Kind of like, a joke. Right. I, the, the, the cab driver was supposed to deliver this ape to some address. Mm-hmm. But then what happened when the guy got in there and there were lines and stuff between the cab driver and the, and the actor, the ape hated this guy for some reason and attacked him and, and, and was hurting the guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a live audience. And there's a guy screaming and trying to get out of a cab. It's on a set. It's not a real cab. With the doors aren't don't even open. I I don't remember that one. We literally had him. We made one only one door open because other one wasn't even was set. Whether the camera was there, or whatever. Right. It just this guy couldn't get couldn't get past the ape out of it. It was just beating the shit out of him. Oh man, that's crazy. And, and uh, I imagine that guy sued. Maybe there's a maybe you sign something when you when you're doing a, a scene with an animal that, that takes the. Dude that off. seems I crazy never, though. I never heard the end of it, but I know this guy didn't wouldn't shoot the scene. Then wouldn't when they calm the ape down and they wanted to shoot it again, didn't do it. Yeah, was he badly hurt or was he like you know because uh, apes didn't. Was it an ape yeah, or was it a chimp- chimpanzee? I think, it was, I think it was an orangutan. Those things are crazy strong, though. Yeah. Yeah. Very strong. Very strong animal, yeah. And that's crazy. So, you would think, like, you know, what if, what if the audience didn't laugh? You know, like, people thought they had to, like, do it over again, you know? You they to... were laughing. <laughs> were they really? I thought that was the show. <laughs> and that was the bigger laughs than anything else in the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh did that have anything to do with why I got the canceled? Man the man wasn't a serious hurt. I mean, there was no ambulance called or anything like that. Right. So, oh, okay. So, so the man wasn't seriously hurt. Right? The date might have bit him a little bit, might have um, probably got squeezed him and, and knocked him over. I mean, they, they swing and they hit you hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you just like beat up like a bar fight. That is you know? crazy. That is but, wild. Um, it's, it, it's funny. We, we had. We didn't have many animals on the show. We'd have something like we'd have. We had a scene where um, where they were all stuck in a cabin somewhere, and, and they had a wild turkey. And this damn turkey we got just would not stop shitting on on the stage, mm. you know. And you're just going, oh man, how much can this bird do? Yeah, you know, and, and you know, you have things like that. Working with animals is, is kind of a drag because. Well, dogs are easy. Dogs are yeah. easy. Cats don't do anything. Um, it's some of these wilder animals that you want because they're funny or more interesting. Right. Or more difficult. Yeah. I mean, that's the old adage, right? Like, never work with children or animals, right? That's like the... Yeah, it is. It. Yeah, I think I'd rather work with animals, you know. Yeah, really? 
<laughs> yeah, that's um, hilarious. But yeah, we were we were with kids and animals, and it was interesting. Um, we once had a full size horse. There was a, there was an episode where Jim rescues a horse. He he um he goes to a race and he bets on this horse and the horse wins. And in his gratitude to the horse, he buys the horse and gives it its freedom. Right. The horse just wants to follow him, so it comes back to the garage and. Then Jim lets it live in his apartment with him. A horse, a full-size mm-hmm. horse, is living in his apartment. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Laverne and Shirley pushing up the stairs. Right. I guess we did that, too, because we had this full-size horse. Yeah, there you go. That's apartment. hilarious. And, You're uh, like, oh, it's working for them. You know, we might as well throw this horse in there. Uh, yeah, I mean, we got to do it. But um, the horse dies. Jim, Jim in, in Jim's bed. So oh, okay. The horse in the bed. He feels sorry. He he He's... He changed the horse's name to something like Bob or something or, or, or Dave or something. The horse's name was like uh, uh, by a nose. You know how mm-hmm. they have all the squeals. Right, right, right. Yeah, for the horse yeah, That was the horse's slave name. He, <laughs> gave it a real name. Yeah. He, he renamed it Daryl or something. Yeah. And let the horse live with him. And everybody said, Jimmy, can't let a horse live with you. And then it was a, the horse died in, in his bedroom. And there's this whole scene where Jim does a eulogy for the horse that's really touching. Hmm. It was it was funny and sad. Uh, Glenn and Les Charles wrote it. And it's one of my favorite pieces of taxi. Jim is so sincere in his eulogy for this horse. And it really was a, was a beautiful thing about how the horse used to run and win these races, it was once a great horse, and then it, it's running as hard as it ever ran, but now all the other, other horses are passing it, and mm-hmm. the horse can't understand why. It's still running as hard as it ever ran, but it's getting older, and horses don't understand about getting older, and he's doing this whole thing. It's just beautiful. And then mm-hmm. the horse died, and he, he uh, you know, he says a prayer for it or something for the horse. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I just remember it was very touching. Mm-hmm. Eulogy for a horse. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I know he yeah. had that episode where he saved the Great Dane, you know, which is the that horse was, and yeah, dogs. Yeah, Alex did that, Save the Great Dane, where yeah. the dogs abused Oh, Jim, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you were thinking, yeah. The other yeah. one was Jim yeah. for the horse. I mean, you know, Alex would never do anything with the horse, but. Right, right, right. He did save the Great Dane, Dane from a, a guy who was abusive with him. Right. Um, we didn't have any trouble with that. We didn't have any trouble with the horse. The only trouble, I don't think the only trouble was was the uh, the active bowel of the turkey, yeah. and the um, and this this ape that would beat up the guy in the yeah. But unfortunately, that wasn't one of our shows. It was somebody else's show, so we just got to laugh about it. Yeah, so, that's crazy. I don't know how they did it when the guy wouldn't do the scene again. I don't know how they did. It. They had to rewrite something. I don't know. Maybe he was outside of the cab then. Maybe they did all lines out of the cab after that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I could see that the, you know, I could see, you know, you're just terrified. You don't know if this animal is going to, because it had that strong reaction that first time. You don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the animal was probably scared too. Here, suddenly this guy enters. It's t- it's already in tiny space mm-hmm. in this back seat of a fake cab. It's only it's smaller than a cab because only part of a cab. Yeah. And then another creature enters your space and, yeah. and I don't know why somebody weren't the wrangler should have had some sense that his animal might go a little nuts mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, um, didn't. yeah that's crazy yeah it's funny getting beat up by an orangutan on, on your on an award winning show you know yeah well, and then that, you gotta drive down sunset you know what I mean and you're like <laughs> you know this is my day you know that kind of thing yeah, you know, or going on Santa Monica Boulevard or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's a pretty, um, pretty incredible. Well, but I think, it's really a fun experience, and so I, I like. I'm saying some of the bad things about it. You know, you that actually sounds like one of the cool bad. things, to be honest with you. You know, oh. what I mean, because that's a story. That's a story within a story. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's fun for everybody who wasn't inside the right with, with the animal. You know, but it's definitely memorable. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those crazy crazy stories that you know i mean you heard about it and you're you're next door so yeah i wasn't even there but everybody was talking about it because it was such a and people were laughing when they're talking about it. at the time probably people were scared because they 
they didn't know what the what was going on in the back when he right. all over the guy, but but what a the guy he, you know he, he probably learned his that, that actor studied those lines mm-hmm. get just right. <laughs> he just he gets in the back and the first thing that happens is his animal attacks him. Right. Yeah, that's crazy. That's that um th- yeah, that was a memorable thing. We also had we had memorable things with our animals, like for example, uh one time we couldn't find the Andy Coffin and we were ready to start the show and Andy Coffin had been there and now he's nowhere near nowhere in the States. They're checking every his dressing room, the 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 uh, conference room, everything. There's no Andy Coffin and and the show was supposed to start fifteen minutes ago. And we don't know what to do. And and somebody got the idea and said, Go check his car. Well, see if his car's here. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. what when Andy drove away, where would he go? Mm-hmm. When the show's starting. They go to the car and Andy was meditating in his car. Mm-hmm. And when they said, Andy, the show is late because you're sitting out here, Andy was cool from his meditation. He said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he just got out of the car and came and did his stuff. Yeah, so we had our experience. One time we had, well, I, I say, you, know, you might have to cut this part out. But one, one time one of our characters came in drunk mm-hmm. or, or high on I don't know what his problem was. He was, he was intoxicated. He was under the influence. Mm-hmm. He couldn't do his lines. And uh, and the executive producer, this was before I was running the show, the executive producer said to me and Barry Kemp, who were both writers on the staff, but not running the show, go rewrite this quickly. Write him out of every scene he's in. Mm. And the audience is here, so you got like 10 minutes to do, to do it. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, they're giving this actor coffee and walking him all over this outside in the cooler air and trying to get him sober up. And finally, said, when they finally told him, uh, you know, two of our writers are now writing you out of this episode, mm-hmm. he sobered up real fast. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I don't, I don't believe it was fake at all. It's just somehow the shock mm-hmm. can can maybe bring you back and he sobered up real fast and he did the original one. Barry and I were kind of annoyed because we had written a really good <laughs> rever- uh, revision of, of it without him and mm. with the gun. And yeah. we kind of wanted to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we get back to the stage, they're, they're already setting up to shoot the original again. So a lot of inter- you know, interesting things happen. Um, yeah. Um, like the, that... The, um, Clearly, I want to say some. Sam Simon was not a drunk. Sam Simon right. was not an alcoholic. Yeah, but he just liked. He wanted to have a little alcohol because of the pressure. I told you the pressure under, and it made him it relaxed him a little bit. Yeah, it so took the, a little bit of the edge off. But he wasn't. It wasn't, wasn't non functioning. Yeah, 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 he wasn't non functioning at all. So. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we'll we'll say goodnight. You go take care of your chickens and. And watch that rooster that's going to sneak up behind you. Yeah, it's time to say happy birthday to somebody. And yeah, we'll say happy birthday to um, scumbags Roger. everywhere. Okay, Roger works. <laughs> All right. No, I like scumbags. Happy birthday to scumbags everywhere, and you know who you are. So. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean you don't get a good birthday. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah we're, we're we're we are still wishing you a happy birthday. All right. So happy birthday, scumbags, happy and um, yeah. Right. So so I'll um, see you next week, Erica.